I've had a few comments asking to go through my design process, so here goes. For most of us, when we start playing Factorio, the go-to design is to build a big bus and feed our factory from that. As we build our factory, the bus can expand to include the wide variety of stuff we need to manage, progressing more or less in a linear fashion across the map. We can upgrade and add more machines if we aren't producing enough of something, but at some point we are going to reach a bottleneck where, most likely, we need just one more conveyor belt or something without any further space being available on the bus. At this point there are a number of solutions and none of them are nice. The first option is to spaghetti an extra conveyor belt in, which might work if all you need is one extra belt, but we all know that one extra belt is never enough. You'll need another and then another and soon enough you'll have a whole other bus worth of spaghetti conveyor belts. The second option is to simply demolish that part of the factory where you haven't got enough space and then to rebuild it um, with the extra capacity built in. Um, I don't like either of these options. Neither of them um, are very satisfactory. You know, if you want to spaghetti extra conveyors in, it's going to look like a mess. So what is the way forward? Well, ultimately, what does your factory need to produce? Sometimes while you're building it, it can feel like you never have enough of the things you need just to be able to build the thing in the first place, the factory. You are going to need thousands of conveyor belts, even for the most rudimentary factory. And sometimes while you're building the factory, you can feel like it isn't producing enough of them to keep up with your expansion efforts. Having to wait for your factory to produce enough of something before you can build that ne next upgrade is annoying. But at the end, once you have finished building the entire factory, you won't need that much manufacturing capacity for conveyor belts other than for what is necessary for science, which, you know, is not going to be a lot. So ultimately, I'll ask the question again, what does your factory need to produce? Your factory only needs to be able to produce the things necessary to build and research the construction process. That's so you can build the factory in the first place. And then once you have finished the construction process, all it needs to be able to do is research stuff and blast rockets into space. So that is really all you need to design your factory to do. Now it was at this point that I started to seek out more complex challenges in Factorio and where I eventually ended up was with the Angel and Bob suite of mods. This suite of mods was more or less the only version of Factorio I played for several years. I had a factory that I was working on and I just couldn't get it right and so I just kept for years I was plugging away at it. Eventually I found got to a point where I was happy with it and I started to investigate further mods and what I found was a time-lapse mod, not what I was looking for. Um, so I got quite excited about the time-lapse mod, so I dived back into vanilla to play around with it and see what I could come up with. I have beaten off the trail here a little, but what I'm trying to get at is that when I came back to vanilla I had gained a whole new design skill set. It is basically this the block. Okay, so what do I mean by a block? For me, it's about collecting a series of manufacturing processes together so that they form a square or rectangular shape. This is partly because of aesthetics, I just think it looks nice, but it also means I can build other blocks directly next to each other. Again, this might seem like something just to look nice, but with this many pipes traveling over large distances, there is much to be gained from building your factory tight together and flow rates in pipes is one of them. If we look at the screen, this is the block that I designed primarily for ox oxygen production in Angel and Bob. I'm not going to go into Angel and Bob too much in this episode, but for my purposes I wanted to explain how I got to where I am. The recipe in this block is to create hydrogen and oxygen from purified water with a catalyst. So there are several systems in play overlapping to form one block. First up, we need to produce purified water. In Angel and Bob, many of the recipes rely on purified water rather than raw water pulled out of a lake. Part of the challenge with this suite of mods is just in managing the process over the whole of your factory. So we've got the purified water, and that, those go into a series of electrolyzers which produces the oxygen and hydrogen. These are in the four corners that you can see on the, on the screen. There's 36 of them and they produce the oxygen and hydrogen that I need. Each, for those, each of these four blocks of nine electrolyzers, I need six hydro stations. So that's what these are doing. They're filled, they're 
pumping the, the purified water into the electrolyzers to produce the oxygen and hydrogen. Each time it runs through this process, it needs a clean catalyst and then it outputs a dirty catalyst, and those need to be cleaned in order to re get re put into the manufacturing process. So that's what these two stations either side are dealing with. They are filtering the, pro the uh, catalysts and then inputting them back in again. It is a complex little block, but as a whole, as a perfect rec square rectangle, it is incredibly easy to fit and build up against, thus achieving my jam together design aesthetic, which I like so much. It also fe feeds perfectly into this sulfuric acid block over here, delivering a ton of oxygen. If we look, the red pipes here, here, here and here, these are the ones dealing with the oxygen and they all travel directly over into the sulfuric acid process which needs a lot of oxygen and one of the problems I had dealing with Angel and Bob was just delivering enough oxygen into sulfuric acid in order to keep this, the, the, the supplies up for the rest of the factory so for this particular version this is where I kind of built this block I built it in order to to be directly opposite the oxygen so that they had nowhere to go but to the sulfuric acid on moving back to vanilla, I started to build in these blocks. So I wanted to take you through the first one that obviously you need, which is the smelting block. As I mentioned before, I don't like demolishing stuff. So if I'm going to build something, it has to be the final version. This is especially pertinent with smelting because later down the road, I'm going to get access to an electric furnace, which removes the requirement for feeding the smelting process with fuel. But for me, this is not what I want to do. I need the smelting now, not later down the road. So if I'm going to build the final version now, it needs to be based on the steel furnaces and not the electric furnaces. So the setup I need to come up with will need to include coal. This also brings me to the idea of widgets. Widgets for me are small collections of items that when you put together into a particular orientation and setup produce a very specific result. So this is the setup I want to use for the smelting. One conveyor belt down the middle, steel furnaces either side and the output outside that. So this requires the ore and fuel to be mixed down the middle. As from what I've built on the screen, you can see that this initial mechanism is, is not ideal because in order for it to be upgraded, the output belt needs to be twice the, the value of the input belt. So it only really works with yellow input belts and a red output belt. If you did it with red input belts and a blue output, then you would be losing about 25% efficiency on, on the mechanism for, trans, for, for mixing these two elements. So this is the widget I came up with. Two splitters opposite each other will output the exact same as the input, meaning it is fully upgradable. Whatever you put in will come out the other end at the same flow rate. If we arrange it in this particular way, then it is, in my opinion, perfectly elegant in function and geometry. It satisfies me both in utility and in its looks. So I use it freaking everywhere. Here is me using it in Bob and Angels for almost no reason at all. I could, I'm more certain I could get it to work without this. There are faster conveyor belts in, available in Angel and Bob's, so the risk of bottlenecks is less. But it's my favourite widget, so I'm going to use it wherever I can. In vanilla, it is everywhere. Here is the smelting setup. Here are the widgets. Here is my low density structure block. Here are the widgets. Here is my modules block. Here are the widgets. In vanilla, it does the job so well that I lay it down first almost as an instinct. You may also notice that the widget and the ingredients all travel down the center of the block. This was another of the improvements I brought over from Angel and Bob. The idea of using a central geometry rather than an edge geometry, as seen in the two examples here, probably doesn't produce any extra factory production Again, I'm confident that with the same output yield can be achieved with the center and edge geometries, but the central one just looks so much better. If we go back to the oxygen example from earlier, the idea of routing all this stuff around one edge just seems like it could, would be so cumbersome. 
like it might look like the spaghetti that we were trying to avoid from before. It also allows things to be symmetrical. All in all, I prefer the center line geometry, so that is what I try to build wherever possible. So back to the smelting setup, I'm using steel furnaces. So in order to convert 45 ore input, which is one full blue conveyor belt, I need 72 steel furnaces. I'm only going to build it with yellow belts at the start. That's all I have access to. Those are the only belts that I have. But it allows me to upgrade to the blue belts once I get my factory to the point where it's producing them. The widget has four outputs, but can feed steel furnaces either side, so we end up with eight rows of steel furnaces. 70 divided by eight is nine, so we need eight rows of nine furnaces, and bingo, here is the block with the widget in the middle. If we go back to our earlier question, what does our factory need to produce? This is the start point of that decision process. How much copper and iron do we need to produce and where does it need to go? For me in vanilla, my rough starting point is to make the same amount of copper and iron. It doesn't work perfectly, but it does seem to produce the most balanced result at the end to make the same quantities of iron and copper. I then route half that copper through circuit boards and half the copper through low density structure. Copper does go to other places. There are quite a few processes which need copper that can't be ignored. Batteries, for example, and red ammunition, I route a significant amount of copper through that. But in terms of volume, this is mostly where it goes. 50% goes to circuits, 50% goes to the low density structure. Iron is a little bit more complicated. For the construction phase of the factory, you're going to need a boatload of iron. Your factory is made of probably at least 75% iron. It goes into absolutely everything. But once you've finished the construction phase, you really don't need that much. A bit into science, and that is about it. But what you do need is a lot of steel. So between the construction phase finishing and the end stage starting, you probably need to shift most of your produced iron into steel. If we look at my most recent vanilla factory, you can see a series of splitters that I can change the priority of based on what I need at that moment without compromising flow rates in any direction. It might look like these conveyor belts aren't being used, but when the steel is full, all that extra iron flows into the rest of the factory. With this as my basis, I can start planning the beginning part of the factory. How many smelting blocks do I need? How many looks elegant? How about eight? And, and that's just what I did. It wasn't really any more complicated than that. The trains are probably something that warrants a, a whole episode by themselves, but you can see that I take the out, output of the trains, bundle them together, and route it through the eight blocks of smelting furnaces, and then collect them all up at the other end. This is just one half the factory, by the way. There are going to be another eight blocks on the other side of the train tracks, so the overall factory production is double what you can see on the screen. Once I have the copper sorted, the next step is to route it through the circuits. In each of my factories, I like to identify the process which is most critical to enjoy my enjoyment of the game. What items are going to make things really cool at the end? And then I put that process at the heart of the factory, you know, the centerpiece, if you will. In Angel and Bob, the, the centerpiece is the smelting setup. For those unfamiliar, it is incredibly fiddly, frustrating, and big. It took me literally years to get it just right. So when I got it just right, I wanted it right in the middle of the factory, kind of like my pride and joy. For vanilla, the centerpiece for me is the circuit boards, all the, all the computer chips. If you can get this part right, so that it's producing literal floods of them at the end, then it is, it is a lot more fun. I mean, that is kind of the heart of the game. And as before, I'm going to do it in blocks so that I can line them up in series and create a super block of them all bashed together, just like with the copper. For the circuits, this is for the green circuits at least, this is the block that I came up with. One of the problems I had in other vanilla factories was in inputting enough iron and copper cables into the assembly machines themselves. I literally couldn't fit enough inserters in the space I had allotted for myself. So in this version, I have spaced everything out a little bit more to allow me to put those inserters in and upgrade it at the point where I need it in the future. In terms of inputs, I have 45 copper coming in at this place this requires 18 assembly machines and outputs 90 copper cables, so I need one conveyor input and two conveyor outputs to transfer to the next part of the process. 90 copper cables makes 30 chips and needs 12 assembly machines, and that is the block. 
For red chips and blue chips, it is a little bit more complicated, but not really. I mean, it really depends how many green chips you want to sacrifice in order to make enough red and blue chips that you need for the rest of the factory. Because ultimately, the, the main component of red and blue chips are the green chips themselves. So if you want more green chips routed through your factory, or your factory needs more green chips, then you just need to reduce the amount of production of your blue and red ones. Whereas if you've got too many green chips, then it may you may as well route them into your red and blue chips. So it really depends how much you want. You know, the red and the blue chips, they're kind of, they're a variable. You won't produce, a ma you won't produce the same amount because the, the amount of green chips you use will vary. So it really depends. Once you have the, the set number of green chips that you're happy with, it really then comes down to what you want, you know, what you feel like producing, with what fits in the space maybe that with regards to blue and red chips, because you're unlikely to produce the maximum amount of those for the, the whole factory like you are for the green chips, which can run off of the copper and the iron independent of any other process, whereas blue and red, obviously, they depend on the amount of green chips. So, and that varies. So anyway, once you have the amount of green chips set up, then you do the red, the, the, the blue and the red ones, and then we move on to the next stage. Before we do that, I just wanted to mention one final thing about my particular design philosophy. Um, I don't use modules or beacons. For, for some purposes, I'll occasionally get them out. In, in the nuclear reactor part of the factory, for example, which is heavily time dependent, I'll almost always use speed modules to speed it up, get the process going so that I can get the nuclear power as quickly as possible. But in general terms, I really prefer not to use either modules or beacons. It, I mean, it's really a tricky one to explain, I suppose. I mean, modules and beacons, they mean that you need less factory units to produce the same amount of output. Um, and I mean, that really means that your factory can be smaller for the same amount of input. And I like really big factories. So I don't, I, I would prefer to just build the bigger version of the same factory that, that doesn't need modules and beacons just because that just feels a lot more satisfying to me. You know, the idea of doubling my inputs through the same sort of relative size of factory because I've modded it with beacons and modules to produce to, to, with efficiency rates and speed rates, etc., to produce double them. It just doesn't work in my mind. Um, I would much prefer to just leave it kind of uh, naturally aspirate, I suppose. That's probably the best way of putting it. Anyway, I don't use modules or beacons. That's 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 the last probable thing that I'll mention about my particular design philosophy. From here, I need to build the part of the factory that produces the things that the factory needs, so that I can finish constructing it. It's also worth mentioning that before, I mean, clear from all my time lapse videos that before I start building the main factory, I set up a pretty decent starter factory so that. I've got access to the it's access to the things that I need to be able to build the factory in the first place. And at some point I'm going to need to cross over from and start use the main factory for for these ingredients rather than the starter factory because ultimately the starter factory has only got access to very very small bits of ore and it's going to run out at some point. So I'm going to need to build the things that the starter factory is building. But I also need to build all of the things for science. I need to build all of the things for rocket launchers. I need to build the things for my perimeter wall. I need to build. I need to build. It's. I, mean, I need to build like a a jumble of things that are all kind of tenuously interconnected. But I don't need a lot of them. I just need some of them. So it doesn't need to produce. It doesn't need to occupy a lot of space. I mean, I mean this is probably where the craft of Factorio, Factorio comes in. It's difficult to explain. Let's jump into a game. Um, this is my this is my vanilla factory from before. So here we are at the start of the jumble. Now I always start with the things that I need the most first. So the thing that I always start with is conveyor belts. So the way to read this is in horizontal slices across the screen. So I build it as slices working away from the main bus. So at the bottom of the screen, we have the iron, the copper, the steel, and all the chips that are coming from the earlier processes in the factory that I've already been through. They almost come through to the bottom right of the screen and then 
turn upwards and work their way up through the main bus, which kind of feeds the jumble, which is on both sides. Then I build them almost as horizontal slices on top of each other. I mean, you can kind of see um, the architecture there. It, it, it kind of reads in that way. Now, for the, for the jumble, most of these items, they, have, they need a gear input. And for me, I don't like the idea of producing all of my gears in one place and then trying to route them through the factory. That just seems like a lot of effort and work. Like I would much prefer, well, what I've actually done is produce them on site, ne right next to the items that need them. So all along this left-hand side of the, of, this, of the start of the jumble are the gears that these processes require. And then I also, I split them off, join them together and run them up this kind of side bus, which is, which is where I put all of the stuff that I need for science. So you can see I've got the inserters, I've got the gears, the grenades, the wall. So I've kind of got this main bus down the middle. I've got this output bus on the left hand side, which deals with the science and, and a couple of other kind of miscellaneous items. And, and in the middle, I've got the, the, the main jumble of things that I'm manufacturing. Now for conveyor belts and all their associated bits and pieces like the underground belts and the splitters, I, at some point in the future, I'll probably have done it already in this part of the factory, I, I have to upgrade all of my yellow belts that I built from the first version. So at some point, I'm before this, where I am in this stage of the game, I take a whole load of yellow belts off of the map and I replace them with a whole load of red and blue ones. So I, in, in previous versions, I've had problems re-inputting those yellow belts back into the system because I've had to put chests around the place to store the, the, the old stuff that I've upgraded and it's not really been kind of fitted in with the rest of the system so that, that those just build up and build up and they don't go anywhere. So for this version I, I built like a whole storage system so that the conveyor belts they come out of the, the, the assembly machines and they go into this set of storage before going anywhere else. So this is what feeds the science and this is what feeds the red belts and all of the other bits and pieces that need the belts as an input. So any belts that I upgrade and put back into the system, they straight away get fed back in and these belts stop any input for beyond a certain level. So this level is maintained at a certain level. Anything over that, nothing gets further put in. And the same thing with the red belts, because red belts, again, I have the same issue. I will run around and upgrade them at some point, and I'm going to re have to re-get them back into the system. So I do the same, the same thing. The red belts, they come out, they go into these storage boxes so that I can get put more back into the system in the future or in the past, wherever you are. And then they get rooted back again into the blue belts. So that everything is kind of recycled to a certain extent, I suppose. And the same thing is done with the with the splitters and the underground belt. So these things, they, they pick them up. They, they're beyond a certain level. It won't go any further. Obviously, I've had to put some back in again. So these are, this is all kind of the leftovers. These, I mean, I've got a limit of 200 in here, but I've actually got... I suppose that's not too relevant. The point is that I've developed a system so that the, I can upgrade, in the, upgrade the, the conveyor belts without producing a whole load of storage bins that are not not linked to the rest of the system. So that's the first slice and the second slice, I suppose. I mean, you could probably count them as one block on its own. And then from there, obviously, the next most important thing that I need is inserters. They need their own gears. So I start off with the gears. Those gears come out, go back, go to, into, the, into the science bus over the side. They also feed all of these inserters. So the only real critical thing from at these points are the amount of conveyor, the yellow conveyor belts and yellow splitters that you produce because you need them for science. Everything else, it doesn't really matter how many assembly machines that you create because um, the quantity doesn't matter. So it really just depends on size. I've used three of each because it fits nicely. I need six assembly machines to make the amount of inserters I need for science. So if I use three for the rest, I just kind of fudge the last one. Um, then it kind of fits in and it, it makes a nice elegant slice. Um, and again, from here, we just build the next one, which is the assembly machines and other bits and pieces that I need that are uh, the, the, most, the, the most pressing. So as you can see, I'm moving away in kind of what I need most at any one moment in time. So 
because the the ingredients for the mining uh, the mining the mine and the most basic assembly machine are the same i normally put them back to back so that they, you can use the same ingredients they then feed into the two assembly machines turrets they're always something that's useful i have a funny feeling i've just put this here just to fill some space because i knew that i would need some row ports it's not necessarily i'm not that's like kind of a more later stage item than the other stuff it's around and then repair packs which you know are obviously fundamental to everything so as I move my way up, I'm obviously going through items that I need less and less urgently. So I've got um, artillery turrets, centrifuges, you know, railway signals, stations, lights, powers. You know, you know, this is kind of stuff. Some of the stuff that I don't really need all that many of. You know, do how many, how many pump jacks are you really ever going to need? I mean, if you if you need more than a hundred, then then you've done some serious exploration exploration work. On the other side of this jumble is kind of the things that don't need gears but also engines like engines take up a lot of space they are a very slow item to build so they need a big dedicated space in your factory and on the other side of this bus that's more of more jumbled up than on this side of the bus this side of the bus kind of deals with Anyway, I, I, you know, if, where, how they're linked together and where they're built is more or less based probably on where I felt like building it at the time. But engines generally get built over here because it's a big block. It's generally the same size sort of block as red ammunition, which is directly below it. So this this kind of sets out the, the size of the block moving upwards. That's why I've got this big space here it's because I ran out of things to build in it. So that kind of just got left behind. I figured if I needed something, if I was gonna, if I needed to build something in particular that I didn't have space for elsewhere, this is where I'd put it. But as it turned out, there was nothing else that I needed to build, so that kind of was left over as kind of some vestigial space. I mean, and again, so as we work our way up, we've got kind of the, the, the rocket launches and all the things that you need for for those, you know, the, the solar panels and accumulators and stuff. And then you've got the really big stuff, so you've got rocket control units, modules. Um, over the other side, we've got uh, low density structure and then just the, obviously the last few bits and pieces that are needed like ammo and stuff so i mean that's that's the jumble um if i mean it does change it's not always the same so here we are in the jumble for what was my most recent time lapse which was the racetrack and you can see it's in a vertical orientation rather than in horizontal like it was before but it's much the same sort of philosophy um, the main difference in, in the previous factory, I had yellow belts mixed in with the main belts and red belts mixed in with the underground splitters. Whereas on this one, I put the storage for the yellow belts and the red belts on one side because I've needed this little bit of extra space down the bottom to produce these extra length underground belts, which I needed because I knew I was going to be spanning some great distances with this racetrack being right in the way of most of my system. So this was like, I, I'm, I changed it slightly to develop this extra little bit of space at the bottom to put the underground belts in because I knew I would need them. So it's not a, it's not a totally fit. This whole jumble is not totally fixed. It's not a blueprint that I copied from before from each one. It's, it's it, I genuinely build it new each time to fit the space. So this one is technically slightly bigger than the vanilla one from before because I need I, I rearranged it to give me a bit more space so in the whereas before the 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 bus the kind of the, the jumble ended on the last inserter now I've got this extra space I brought repair packs put them in here and everything else is kind of slightly different um, so it, the jumble is kind of it's 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 a fun part for me I enjoy building it it's you know it and it, and it looks nice I, I enjoy the, 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 the finished product of it um, so it's not something I copy across. It's something that I take a lot of pleasure in building. But but that is the jumble. I mean, um, how you particularly deal with the things that you need to build and all of these things, these particular things that need to be constructed and get put, fed into the system, it's really up to you. Is how you, you know, that's this is as I said, this is probably the most craft-like part of the factory. You know, it's how you find, find kind of fit everything together, fit all the little things that you need. Um, not everything that you need is a big ginormous block. Some of it is quite small and intricate. Okay, so back to the time lapse. 
At this point, I'm happy with I have enough space to make all the things I need to make. I haven't finished the jumble yet, there is more to come, but there's only so much factory I can build completely blind. What I need now is power, so I need to build lots of turbines and furnaces. Coal is also needed for the smelting processes, so the coal needs to flow out of this section as well. In this factory, I am using water barrels to feed everything that needs water. This is something that I have carried over from Bob and Angel, and it allows me to transport a much greater quantity of water than can be done in pipes, at least reliably and at a rate I can calculate, and without a loss of pressure regardless of distance. So all the steam turbines need a constant feed of water barrels, and the water barrels need a constant feed of steel, which is a bit chicken and egg, how to make steel without power, or how to make power without steel, but the, with the decent starter factory, it isn't completely insurmountable. This approach of using water barrels for power is not a decision that should be taken lightly. It is heavily dependent on a very intricate setup to maintain the correct balance of barrels in the system. And if it goes wrong, it is very difficult to get going again because you won't have any power to fill the barrels in the first place. I personally like the challenge, but it isn't for everybody. Now that I have power, I can turn everything on and start producing things. It is at this point that I need to start worrying about biters. Up until now, the factory wasn't producing much, so there wasn't really any pollution to worry about. The biters have more or less left me alone. But now that I'm starting everything up, I know I'm going to get a fair amount of attention. Priority becomes turrets and red ammo. At the start, before I began the big build, I ran around the factory making a basic perimeter wall and a, an empty conveyor belt that was to be filled with red ammo at some point in the future. This is pretty much that point where it starts to have a real defensive purpose. It should also be noted that this is just a temporary perimeter wall and won't survive any real sustained effort from the biters. So anytime things start to get a little crazy, feeling like I need to be almost everywhere at once, I call in the trains and let things settle down. At this point, I only need enough resources to continue building the factory, not run it at full stretch. So as long as that remains the case, as long as I've still got the right amount of ingredients and I can still continue building, I don't need to push the factory too hard. From here, it is just a simple case of setting up the research. Because of the way I've routed it around the factory, this is a really straightforward process. The only real complication is in how many assembly machines to dedicate to each research colour, but this can be calculated with the right mod. From here we go to oil. Oil is the first real complex challenge, because we are now dealing with three outputs that all need to be managed from just one input. What this means is that if heavy oil fills up, for example, we won't be able to process any further oil for the petroleum we probably need. We can start putting down storage tanks, but this will only get us so far. The way to manage this is to have a conver conversion process so that we can convert heavy oil into light oil and then light oil into petroleum. But we don't want to convert oil all of the heavy and light oil because we also need that for other processes. The way I get around this issue is to set up a small circuit network that only converts the heavy oil into light oil when heavy oil is above a certain level and when light oil is below a certain level. I do a similar thing with the light oil into petroleum process. This way I always have sufficient stock of the smaller oils and if it goes over that sufficient level it gets converted into petroleum which is really the goal of this whole part of the factory. From this it is just a simple case of building the thing in much the similar way I've built everything else, hooking up the circuit network in just the right way and it is done. Nuclear is the next real challenge, but for a slightly different reason. Number one, uranium takes forever to process. And number two, you need to create a process that has the exact same inputs and outputs, which can be a little tricky to get your head around at first. Anyway, by processing uranium, we get 0.7% U235. But in order to power the nuclear power stations, we need 5% U235. So we need to use the Covarex process to refine the U235 to the levels that we need. But again, we don't want to refine everything. We don't want 100% U235. We just want 5%. Again, with a circuit network, we can divide the amount of U238 in the system by the amount of U235. And if the ratio is greater than 19, so 5% to 95% is a ratio of 1 to 19, then we want the system to run the process. And if it is less than 19, we want it to stop the process. This way, no matter how much uranium we pump into the system, and so long as we have enough storage space for it all, it will always try and maintain the correct balance 
of these two elements. It won't be perfect. Some of the factories I have had the process finish at ratios of two and three because the amount already in the system, but over time it balances itself out and without any real outside intervention. From here, we really are into the end stages of the factory. You know, we've built every, I've built everything um, that needs to be built. I've powered it all. It's got water. It's got. I've got all of the ingredients I need um, to sustain the factory, to replace any parts that might get broken by biters or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so from here, it's just a case of finishing it off. So um, I, I, I probably finish. I, I start working on the perimeter wall. Um, that's quite a long stage in the time lapse. I tend to take quite a lot of time in that, so I'm literally just going to brush over it for our purposes in this episode. Once that is done, I start to look at setting up outposts so I can start delivering the quantities of the ore that the, the factory is really designed for. Up until now, it's been run at a very low level just so that I can finish it. From this point, it's now more or less finished, and I need to start pumping in the, the, the materials in and fixing issues because obviously there's obviously there's always going to be problems i'm always going to miss something along the ways and the only real way to find them is to start pumping the materials in seeing where it goes making sure it's going to the right place um so that's basically where it goes from there once i have the outposts i need to start delivering supplies so turrets and repair packs walls etc so that the, the, the robot network can fix any issues once they're attacked by biters then I will need to go around upgrading, upgrading all the belts and assembly machines and inserters in the main factory so that they are capable of delivering and inserting the materials that they were designed to deliver. Which again, is not really you can't really see what's going on until you're delivering with the right amount of materials and seeing if it's actually processing that right amount of materials. So that you upgrade all of this. It, it kind of, it, one leads from the other. Ultimately, most of this comes down to the main factory itself and what you need to deliver to it to keep it running. Um, and that comes down to you. What do you want your factory to achieve? Are you more interested in SPM? In, in which case, you know, you probably need to use a lot of modules and beacons, and this guide probably isn't really for you. How many rockets do you want to launch? How much work do you intend on putting into the game on to developing and maintaining your outposts? Because they are going to deplete, and you're going to need new ones over and over again. I mean, how how far deep into this game do you really intend on taking it? And then I remember my best advice would be to just design and develop the factory that kind of fits that size that you intend on working with. You know, if you're just looking to um, have a just a few outposts so that you don't have too much involvement in the game and it just kind of never really depletes because you're using it so slowly, then you just really need a, a smaller factory. Or you no know, rocket launches. You know, how many do you need? You know, the point of the game is really only to to launch one rocket. You know, the, the, it's only really <laughs> since people have built bigger and bigger factories that rockets have become a, a, something that's been multiple. You know, that was never the, 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 the original thought of the game from my memory of, of playing it. It was all, from my earlier factories, it was always just about developing a factory so that you could just launch one rocket. The idea of developing multiple ones was, was, was beyond my thought process at that time. But anyway, that's probably the best that I can do for for this moment in time for to give you an overview of how I approach this whole design process, um, the way I fit things together, the way I kind of piece the factory together. But you know, it's really just it's just my this is just my interpretation of the game. You know, really it comes down to what what is your interpretation of the game? Where do you intend on taking it? Um, that's so. Hopefully, I've been some kind of help in that process.